Welcome to Principal Center Radio, bringing you the best in professional practice. Here's your host, director of the Principal Center and champion of high-performance instructional leadership, Justin Bader. Welcome, everyone, to Principal Center Radio. I'm your host, Justin Bader, and I'm honored to welcome to the program Dr. Tanya Balch, and welcome back to the program, Dr. Bradley Balch. We're here today to talk about their book, Building Great School Counselor Administrator Teams, a systematic approach to supporting students, staff, and the community. And now, our feature presentation. Tanya and Brad, welcome to Principal Center Radio. Thank you. Thank you. So you have written a book together on that relationship, that critical relationship between administrators and school counselors, right? The dark side and the good side, right? As we're often told (laughs) once we cross over to the dark side. What did you see happening in the field and, and what did you see as the need in our profession for a book addressing that relationship? Sure. There's just absolutely so many pressures bearing down on the important work that both our school principals and our school counselors do that we believe the future of that relationship is going to be based on the keyword team. What we know from our work with the team concept is that it, effective teams have role and responsibility overlap. And we also know that from that role and responsibility overlap comes a source of tension. The book addresses the many topics that our principal and school counselor teams face on a daily basis. And we also had to add an interesting lens as we worked our way through the book and that in many cases, the counselor supervisor will also be the principal. And we know that that's going to impact that relationship But it doesn't negate the fact that those two important individuals within a school can't work autonomously uh, and accomplish what could be done far more effectively as a team. I would also add to that that both roles, the school counselor and administrator, time is of the essence. There's simply not enough time in the day to get everything done. And one of the things we were hoping to do through the book was to help teams effectively utilize their time by identifying strengths in their skill sets so that they could effectively utilize that time. And we have professional development activities built in to help identify and hone some of those skills. Well, and I appreciate that framing around teamwork because sometimes we don't think of it as teamwork. We think of it as a division of labor that if it's a disciplinary situation or if it's a staff evaluation situation, that goes to the admin side. And if it's more about you know supporting and helping students and guiding them and counseling, then of course that goes to the counselor side. And I know that division uh, also reflects your work at Indiana State University. I know, Brad, you're a professor and uh, Dean Emeritus in the College of Education there and Tanya you're a professor in the the counseling department there. And I wonder what you have seen come out of some of those strong counselor administrator relationships. What does it look like when we're not just dividing and conquering, right? It's not just a division of labor, but we really are in a school working as an admin and counselor team. That's a great question, Justin. And there's many elements I think that would inform that. But in general, you'll note that each chapter in the book really gets at the heart of strong communication and trust among team members. And without those two elements in place, functioning effectively as a team is always going to be a bit compromised. The way we approach this is to consider that every individual in that team, and we recognize that in some of our larger schools, we may have deans, assistant principals, Uh, social workers, counselors, the team complexion may change greatly depending on the size of the school or how the school is configured. But assuming that a team, no matter how they're gathered together, we assume that they have varying gifts and talents, that we know we have job descriptions and policies and guidelines that kind of script those day-to-day operations in those various positions. But at the end of the day, a strong team is willing to look at one another's gifts and talents and exploit and take advantage of those things in a way that benefits the entire team. So we might have something as simple as a a student behavior issue. And it could be in this case that the counselor has a relationship not only with the student, but the parent to more effectively address that. And so while the principal might assume a disciplinarian role or the role of following the student handbook in terms of next steps, the counselor can prove to be an enormous resource in helping the behavior not occur again, which is ultimately the goal, but also working with the parents or other key stakeholders and informing them on next steps 
so that the team together has accomplished things more effectively than if they were independently trying to work on these actions. I think also on a real ground roots level, I was working with a administrator from a more rural school district and he meets with his counselor. He has two counselors in his building and he meets with them on a weekly basis to determine what students need additional attention or what their plans are relative to testing or scheduling. But they have a weekly meeting. I mean, I believe he said like on a Tuesday at eight o'clock, something like that. Another way when you talk about what things look like among effective team members, we try to address not only student related issues in the book, but also address community and parent stakeholders as well as faculty and staff. And oftentimes uh, when change agendas are operationalized and, and our schools today are simply defined by change in strong relationship to opportunity and continuous improvement, there's always an opportunity to divide and conquer if the team isn't operating together effectively. It could be as simple as a change in the master schedule or implementing new student supports, but there'll always be stakeholders who understand which individual might further the position that they want to embrace as opposed to embracing the changes presented. And having that team working effectively together, they're speaking in one voice. And so as the school works through difficult change, that team is able to hold together more effectively. Well, Tanya, I want to ask you from the counseling side, what are some of the things that principals tend to do when they're working with counselors that don't work or that cause some heartburn and cause some kind of adjustments to need to be made? And on the flip side, what are some things that really do work well for counselors that are helpful for administrators to do? That's also a great question. And unfortunately, Brad and I own the answer to that question in that principal prep programs and school counseling programs don't always adequately teach particularly the administrators how to effectively utilize their counselors and from a counseling standpoint, how to effectively advocate for your time. It's easy to know what to do with an English teacher or a math teacher, but if you're unsure, as an administrator, if you're unsure of the skill set that your counselor brings, oftentimes a new counselor would be told, do what the old counselor did, you know, fill in that role. And because counselors don't have a set schedule like teachers do, it's easy for them to fill in and you substitute teach or fill in in crisis situations. So I think one of the challenges is um, effective time utilization. Counselors are often asked to do fair share duties, which all teachers and administrators do as well. Um, but really trying to effectively utilize their time, I think, is probably the most frustrating part on a school counselor's perspective. And I think from a counseling perspective, I think having an appreciation for the skill set and knowledge the counselors bring to the table, being considered a part of the leadership team is important to them. Oftentimes, counselors have information about students or you know families that others in the building don't have privy to. And so having administrator that they can talk to and share some of that information can be very helpful. Many of our rural counselors, there's not another support in the building. And so having a relationship with the administrator that supports and understand them, I think would be most helpful. I absolutely agree with that. One of the things we've noticed with effective teams is that in a strong relationship, they're able to articulate through great listening skills among team members what the core priorities are in the school. And as a team, they help one another focus on those priorities. What we too often see is with so many pressures bearing down on our schools, everything's a priority. So we walk away with no priorities at all. That team concept can really help one another hone in on what's the mission, what's the vision, or what's our dream and how are we going to get there and stay focused on the core priorities that meet that objective each and every day. I think that's a great point. And it's the kind of thing that can change, right? We don't have to say, as we alluded to earlier, that because the previous counselor did this set of things, that all future counselors then have to do exactly that set of things. And I'm thinking about our situation uh, when I was an elementary school principal, which obviously the counseling role is very different at the elementary level, but still the expectations play a huge role and the goals of the school play a huge role in determining exactly who does what and how that all works. And, and one of the conflicts or the, the tensions that we had to deal with was that when we got a counselor, which was the result of some district decisions, you know, it was a funding thing that counselors were funded for all the schools all of a sudden, and we got a counselor. And we found that everyone had expectations for what that counselor was going to do. 
most people did not share their expectations until they went unmet or they, they were unsatisfied in some way. And one of the big things was people expected the counselor to do one-on-one, -on -one, basically therapy sessions, you know, with some of their students. And certainly we had some students who needed that. But that was different from kind of the job description and what the counselor had been told was the job. And we had to really clarify that, uh, not just once, but we had to renegotiate it repeatedly as the position evolved and as needs evolved in the school. Could I add something to that too, Justin, that I think is really important. School counselors are trained to do individual counseling, but to a limit. And they are very um, trained very much to know what their limits are and when they should refer out. One of the real challenges is when you have students who come to school with a lot of social emotional issues, particularly if it's related to family, and you're in a setting that's an academic setting. You know, if I'm a parent and my child has some depression issues or anxiety, I can schedule an appointment, take them to a mental health therapist, and I'm fully consenting and giving permission for my minor child. When the child comes to school and shares that information, the school counselor is there, but the parent hasn't necessarily signed saying, yes, I want you to provide these services. So it can be a real balancing act for counselors to walk as far as what they should ethically and legally do. This conversation led to one of the most enjoyable chapters we wrote. And sadly, um, there was strong encouragement to change the title. It was called All Other Duties as Assigned. And we dealt with the very issue that you were describing as a strain in your school. Uh, that's now been rewritten as Chapter 8's Master Scheduling, Supervision, and Testing. But the um, Ask a National Model, the American School Counseling Association, provides uh, great language to help support counselors in advocating for the important role that they provide in the school. And one of the things they're encouraged to do under the Ask a National Model is to develop an annual agreement with their principals to sit down and talk about what their days and their weeks and an overall academic year schedule might look like because they are directed to provide not only those face-to-face -face or one-on-one -on -one supports, but to provide small group supports and whole group or large class supports as well throughout the year. And if they're utilized in an effective way, there's an enormous, just an enormous amount of wealth that they can bring to that whole child approach that we're all hoping we can succeed at. That provides more time for prevention and intervention as well. Yeah. And that aligns with my experience as well, that, that when we set that expectation that the counselor was going to work with groups of students and of course would talk to a student anytime a student needed to talk to the counselor, you know, the investments, the big investments of time were going to have the, the greatest impact if they were on those school level kinds of things. So ultimately, we embarked on a little bit of a, of a PBIS journey and purchased some curriculum that teachers could use in the classroom because we realized some of what needed to happen should not just happen when a student has to go see the counselor. It should be happening at a preventative level in the classroom. I greatly appreciate the keyword preventative that you just used. We have focused an enormous amount of energy and effort, even resource, on the reactive piece, and so much more could be done on the prevention side. We have a chapter that deals with crises um, and all types of crises, but there's a particular piece in there that we pull out. We call crisis preparation and prevention. Um, because we'd like to see, especially around the mental health, the social emotional health, the behavioral issues, we'd like to see much more done with prevention. And we offer some tips in there to do that. And how can counselors advocate for that? Because I, I feel like if there is that kind of divide and conquer mentality, if the counselor is not seen as a leader in the school or hasn't been given the opportunity to kind of advocate for those school level systems and those school level changes that might need to take place, what are some ways that counselors, you know, can kind of elbow for that seat at the table and advocate for those changes uh, that they see as necessary at the school level? I think for that would be data collection. That's something that we have focused a lot on in our program here, teaching our students to collect data to have evidence saying that, you know, if I run this small group, you know, behaviors reduced in the classroom or attendance improved and trying to tie the work that they do either in the classroom setting or a group setting back to um, the mission and vision values of the school goals. So whether that's tying back to academic achievement or attendance or even discipline issues, that they can have some concrete data to say, this is what I can accomplish if I'm given the time to do so. Tanya and I both support a school district at this point as evaluators, and the district's trying to renew an emphasis on the role of school counselor. And so their efforts are district-wide, and it's been exciting to be a part of that. And so early on, uh, counselors were describing what their school-based challenges were. 
in data and the lack thereof to make their case was certainly one of those. Another thing that they said is my principal wants to help me. He or she just doesn't know how. And oftentimes I find my way on the faculty agenda, but I'm the last item. We run out of time. And so we never get to some of those social emotional pieces. Our focus has been centered around measures of academic success, the statewide assessments and those other key issues that we're feeling an awful lot of pressure to attend to. And so there have been many efforts. One, that they tell us is I absolutely need my principal support to advance the school counseling agenda. And they are basing many of their implementation principles on the Ask a National model. We provide several resources in the book that can drive uh, the reader to those resources, moving them up in the agenda so that they're in a place of, of greater importance. And then, of course, we're still hearing this theme a year into implementation, and that is time, time, time. I just need time to do the job of a school counselor. One of the challenges is moving from the current state that a school is in as far as the counselor being in a reactionary position, moving that to we ask a national model where they have time for in the classroom, individual and group counseling, that in-between transition time is what schools are really struggling with. I think that there's a lot of momentum given the more awareness of mental health issues in schools today that I think administrators and communities are demanding more counselors and more prevention and intervention. It's just moving from the old system to the new system has some growing pains. You know, as we look at the enormous challenges that our students bring to school and the family issues as well, this may have a chance to redefine public schooling in a bit because our public coffers simply aren't deep enough to deal with all these issues. And I think this may give rise to reaching out to agencies that can provide those appropriate responses and maybe redefine agency support in a way. And school counselors are really well positioned to help us with those next steps. I wonder if we might speak to the concerns of secondary counselors, because obviously my background is at the elementary level, but I know at the secondary level, counselors are asked to do an enormous range of jobs or wear an enormous number of hats, everything from registrar to assistant principal without the <laughs> without the salary schedule to testing coordinator. And I know assessments and state tests, you know, ACT, SAT, all of that plays an enormous role in a lot of secondary counselors work. I wonder if we could talk about the advocacy and the, the figuring out how to redefine that role to better meet students' needs, what that looks like so that counselors are not just one more person that the administrators can kind of dump test coordination on and not have to worry about it. I think part of that comes back again to advocacy, data collection, all of those types of things. The reality for high school counselors, it is it falls squarely on their shoulders to ensure that every student has the courses that they need to graduate. They could lose their license, be sued if they don't ensure all of that. So the stakes are extremely high. I think it gets back to the idea, again, of teamwork and having an administrator or administrative team that values and recognizes the importance of the work that the counselors could be doing and being able to spread some of that other testing for out. You could have your support staff that could help with testing, SAT testing, has a stipend with it, so there may be a teacher that would be interested in doing that. School counselors are trained at the master's level, and a lot of those jobs that they're given to do really could be done by someone without that level of an education. And I think just pointing that out and advocating is something that's really important to do. I think it's going to be very challenging unless you have an administrator support. Kind of comes back to trust and communication. When we're in these buildings talking with administrators and counselors about the rules, a counselor will say, well, I've been asked to help out with morning supervision, and so I don't have opportunities to really meet with some of those students that are going to have a rough start to her day. And of course, I've got some lunch duty and I do the testing and the master scheduling. Those are often the same schools where we'll see instructional coaches that are maybe being used as behavior interventionists because that's somewhere where they can help. So culture drives a lot of this and we've got to be able to step back from all of it and take a look more efficiently at what, what gifts and talents everyone's bringing to the job and use them for the job that they were intended to do. But I think our schools are just feeling enormous change on every front, and they're probably not thinking strategically from a systems level and how to best deploy individuals. We do hope uh, that for those that embrace this team concept, they're going to find immediate efficiencies and how they utilize their time. We have some exercises in there, some PD, in which they have opportunities to talk about how they're spending the day and their priorities and you know and what they're dealing with. And what we find is that for counselors and principals that work autonomously and don't have chances to interact, 
there's actually a lot of redundant work going on, whether it's contacts with parents, meeting with students, uh, a lot of day-to-day -day operations. Once that team has a chance to talk those things through, they can find efficiencies in their individual times throughout the day. I also think, you know, most schools have alternate schedules, whether it's for faculty professional development or snow days or whatever. So it's not like all schools need to reinvent the wheel. It's looking differently at the current schedules and policies that they have in place. So the book is Building Great School Counselor Administrator Teams. And Tanya and Brad, I just want to thank you for, for your insights and your teamwork on this. This has been very cool to have a team approach to authoring a book and, and to considering that one of those critical relationships that we have in every school between the school counselor and the, uh, the school administrators. If people want to uh, learn more about the book or learn more about your work or about the work of counselors specifically, if they're coming from the admin side, where are some of the best places for them to connect and find resources? Well, they are welcome to contact us through the Indiana State University website, our email addresses. Uh, we both have Twitter accounts and we are working very hard at increasing our activity in Twitter. So we hope they'll take advantage of that and join us as well. And they can find our book at Amazon and Solution Tree. Call or ride anytime. So Tanya and Brad, thanks so much for joining me on Principal Center Radio. Justin, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Principal Center Radio. For more great episodes, subscribe on our website at principalcenter.com slash radio. 